Thank you for tuning in to this sermon podcast from Redeeming Hope. We exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and helps others find Him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. If you want more information about our church or would like to support our ministry, go to our website at redeeminghope.org. Please enjoy this sermon podcast. We are continuing our series today, uh, Jonah, the Relentless Love of God, based on the book of Jonah. And if you turn with me to Jonah chapter one, we're going to reread some of what we looked at last week and then extend the passage a little bit. It will be on the screen as well. The title of today's message is Love in the Storm. Love in the Storm. And you will learn what storm I'm talking about as we get into this text. Jonah chapter one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Verse 7. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? So the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Verse 11, they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it, I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, you told Paul that your grace is sufficient for us, and your power is made perfect in weakness. And this is what we're going to find in Jonah's life. May we find it in ours, especially as we hear your word today and as I teach your word that your grace and your spirit would be at work in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is one of the books of the prophets. Jonah was a prophet, but it's not a record of prophecies, which is typical of the prophetic writings, Isaiah, Jeremiah. You're just going to find a record of their prophecies. This particular book is about the prophet himself running from the Lord. And it's a, it's a simple story about two people running. Jonah is running from God, and God is running to Jonah. And last week, we saw that the theme of the book is sin and grace. The title of last week's message was Running from God. And the theme of the book is sin and grace. And there's a lot of books in the Bible where those things are discussed theologically, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of grace, justification by faith, the propitiating blood of Jesus, all that stuff. They're discussed sort of with theological assertions. But in this book, we actually see sin and grace at work, and we see how God moves toward Jonah in spite of him, not because of him. And aren't you glad that God dealt with Jonah that way? And aren't you glad that God deals with you and I that way? Reminds me of what uh, that U2 lead singer Bono said some time back. He was talking about how popular the idea of karma is in society, and, and he says, you know what? I don't want karma, because I've done a lot of bad stuff. He goes, I actually need grace 
because I've done enough bad and put enough bad out in the universe that I got a lot of bad stuff coming to me. And I'm hoping I don't get what I put out into the universe. I need grace. We all do. Jonah did. And that's what we see in the book is God is showing grace to Jonah in spite of him. So sin is running away from God. We're going to define sin in this conversation in that way. Sin is running from God. And grace is being hunted down by God so he can interrupt our self-destructive choices and behavior. Another thing I want to repeat from last week is that until you recognize that you run from God, all of us run from God. Like Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. You cannot grasp or believe the grace of God no matter how religious you are. You can go to church every Sunday. You can read the Bible, but you won't see the big E on the I chart, the big message of the Bible, which is the message of the grace of God in Jesus Christ running to this world through the cross. So we all run. And the question is, how do we run? Some of us run outside of God's law, like the prodigal son did, ran from the father. But some of us run inside of God's law, like the older son in the prodigal son story, whose heart was separated from the father because of his good deeds. And he didn't like the grace he was showing to his younger brother. So when we come to God, we shouldn't simply see ourselves as hurting people or self-sufficient people or uh, you know, a troubled people suffering people, though we may be and are those things, we should actually see ourselves as fugitives and that God is rescuing us from running from him. And it's as old as the Garden of Eden itself as Adam and Eve ran from God in the garden and God called out, Adam, where are you? And guess what he's calling out in the book of Jonah to the Ninevites? And guess what he's calling out in the gospel to us? Where are you? He's coming to us. So until you acknowledge that you do run from him, you can't find him. And I challenge you to, to think that way. And if you've never thought like that, to start thinking that way. And it's possible that the reason maybe that some of you are not experiencing God is he's simply a concept to you, not an intimate friend, because we don't understand the idea of sin and grace. We don't understand the essence, the big message in the Bible, the big message in the gospel, which is not rules and law. It is love and grace in Jesus Christ. I have a friend named Chris um, not the Chris that was up here. Um, I knew him back in the late 90s. Uh, he was the son of a pastor. Um, I mean, rebelled big time and ended up being a drug mule across the Mexican border in Texas and um, got caught <laughs> as a, a 17, 18 year old kid. Uh, got in big trouble with the law and, and came to Christ after that. Had an experience with the Lord where he really did discover salvation by grace in spite of all that he'd done. Um, and, and a lot of it was rejecting the legalism that was part of the, the teaching of his father and the church that he'd been a part of. Well, he ran again. So he walked with the Lord maybe for a couple years, got married. Uh, he and his wife just really walked away from the Lord, got into a swinger, uh, had a swinger marriage. If you don't know what that means, uh, look it up, Google it. Um, and just really ran from God. And I reached out to him from time, just loved him from time to time. And I was probably the only voice in his life for about, 20 years that represented Jesus. And then as these things go, uh, that lifestyle inevitably failed and his life came crashing around him and he reached out to me and to Heidi. And we began to just give him the love of God and we began to show him grace and, and talk to him about the redeeming love of Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ if you'll turn from your sin. And what he said afterwards was, he said, you know, I ran and ran and ran and ran for 20 years and I thought I was 20 years away from God. But when I turned around, literally Jesus was right there next to me. And that's what we find, isn't it? That's the nature of God and his grace. He's waiting for us. He's right there. So last week we saw that Jonah was given marching orders by God to go to Nineveh, which is the capital city of Assyria the seat of political and military power of the bad guys, okay? These guys had hurt Israel. Therefore, Jonah did not want to go and he did not want to preach to them sin and grace because he said in, in chapter four of Jonah, like we said last week, he said, uh, I knew that you're a God of grace and mercy and that if I cried out against them that, and, and they repented, that you might, you might uh, show them mercy and grace. So I ran. That's why I ran. He didn't want to succeed. He hated these guys, these people were the enemy. They'd hurt Israel. And so he despised them. He wanted them to be punished. He wanted them to go down. And he didn't want to be the agent of their rescue. 
No, no. So he ran east and Nineveh was west. So Nineveh was near Iran and Iraq today. Uh, he ran west 3,000 miles, tried to go 3,000 miles west on a, on a ship um, the opposite direction. That, that's how far he ran. And what we find today is the plot thickens. He, he runs, he gets on this ship, and a, and a storm comes. We see two things in this chapter I want to talk about today. The storm and Jonah's response. We're going to look at the storm and then how Jonah responded to the storm. So first of all, let's talk about the storm. Now, I know all of you have been in storms, figurative storms, but this one way different. God actually sent Hurricane Jonah. I mean, special design storm just for, just for Jonah. But he sends it we find, to save Jonah's life. So there was love in the storm. There was intent in the storm. And this shows that God is not tame and he often does the unexpected, doesn't he? Reminds me of the, the brief conversation that Lucy has with, uh, is it Mr. Tumnus in uh, Not the Lord of the Rings, the Chronicles of Narnia, where he's talking about Aslan, the great lion, who's the Christ figure in the book. And, he's, and she says, well, is he is he good? And his answer is, uh, well, he's, he's safe. Uh, he, he's good, but he's not safe. He's good, but he's not safe. And, and that's what we find in God, isn't it? God sends this storm. So God, God is not tame. We can't put him in our little box and say, okay, behave, God, do this. This is what I want you to be for me. He, he won't fit in our box or our expectations. He often does the unexpected. So why would God send a killer storm to save Jonah's life? The brief answer is this. Jonah has been commissioned by God to preach sin and grace to a city, the city of Nineveh, but Jonah knows nothing of sin and grace himself. And so he's giving Jonah a classroom to teach him about the grace of God. So again, the essence of the Christian message is grace. The summary of the gospel is grace. Actually, Paul summarizes it that way in the book of Acts. So it records a conversation he's having uh, with the other apostles, and he calls it the gospel of God's grace. That's how he summarizes it. That is the gospel. The gospel means good news. It means something has been done, not something we must do. It's a finished work, and he summarizes it as the gospel of God's grace. Not our achievements, not our moral record, not our zeal or devotion to religion, we stop trusting in any of those things to earn us points or gain acceptance by God, and we approach him on the basis of Christ's work, on the basis of grace alone. We're accepted because Jesus paid the sin debt that we could not pay, and he did it for no other reason except for love and grace. So we saw that Jonah ran from the Ninevites because he hated them and he felt superior over them. And this superiority, that he, this superiority that he felt over the Ninevites shows that he did not really grasp sin and grace. If you're superior, then you think that something elevates you before other people and gives you extra points with God. And if you think that way, then you don't fully grasp the grace of God yet. The gospel hasn't gone down far enough. So Jonah did not understand the message that he was called to preach. And how often are we like that? How often do we find that actually the discovery of God's love and the discovery of God's grace actually seems to come in stages? As God, as God peels back the layers of our ways of thinking, peels back the layers maybe of our experience in the past or our expectations or how we think it ought to work or how we think God, how God ought to act, he begins to peel back the layers of that through circumstances and through learning and understanding the gospel until it just becomes clear and clear and clear. And quite honestly, sometimes it does come through circumstances. I know in my life, and I'm not going to go deeply into my testimony, maybe I'll take a Sunday sometime over the next year and just share my testimony. But in 2001, I began a four-year journey through uh, severe depression and anxiety disorder. And I had to, so bad, I had to get out of ministry for a season. And I didn't think I'd ever get back. I didn't think, I, I thought I was disqualified. Um, you know, I just couldn't see any path back to uh, be able to be in ministry again. I just felt so broken, so crushed by this trial. Um, and if it weren't for the grace of God, um, it would have probably gone farther than it did. But, you know, the Bible says in him, all things hold together. So even in our trials, we need to learn to look where God 
is sustaining us, restraining evil and holding us together. And he does that. He's the one who's sort of the gatekeeper of our trials. He's the gatekeeper of the storm. And uh, he, he is the one who allows or does not allow anything that comes into our lives. And he allows and controls the frequency of it and the intensity of it and the length of it. And just like in the book of Job, he says, that's enough. Stop right there. And so in 2001, I had a, a trial like that that was very severe. Um, but previous to that in my life, I, was, I would say I was very much like Jonah. I was very legalistic. I, I, had, a, I had this sense of religious superiority. Uh, it was sort of, uh, I sort of downloaded it from uh, one of the churches that I was a part of uh, that just basically taught us in the world that we're the, you know, this is the center of God's kingdom and, and uh, th this is where God is moving and our doctrine is, is the right doctrine. And, and it was very legalistic, very much about um, earning uh, acceptance by God. And, and I, was, I was, as a young man, uh, one of their poster child. And yet uh, on the inside, even though I was preaching, I was traveling and, and doing all kinds of ministry, uh, I was broken on the inside. And this was, a, this was a time when I had what I now call a grace conversion. And so I think what we're seeing in Jonah is that he's having his grace conversion. And we all need that. Matter of fact, uh, Galatians 3 says, will you continue in the flesh that which you began in the spirit? Think about that. It's almost like there's two places in our lives where we need to, to really understand and grasp and apply the grace of God. Will you continue in the flesh that which you begin in the spirit. In other words, it's possible to begin by grace. Nobody comes to Jesus uh, by works, right? If you truly come to Christ and you're truly saved, everybody says, I come by grace alone. But it is possible, and this is my story, to come to Christ by grace and then continue the rest of the Christian life in the flesh and be under law, even though you began in grace. And that's what happened to the Galatians. Will you continue in the flesh that which you began in the spirit? And so we, we need to grasp the grace of God. We need a grace conversion. Jonah needed one, and this was his classroom. So in some way, Jonah was being asked to do something that he knew he would fail at because of his superiority, his racism, his hatred, and his self-righteousness. Why did God allow this? Because God knew this was the only way to show Jonah the major structural flaws in his own soul and his thinking. Tim Keller, who I said last week, uh, this whole series, I've been very influenced by Tim Keller's teaching on the book of Jonah. He said this about the book of Jonah. The application of the book of Jonah is as scary as it is comforting. And here's why he would say that. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good for those who love God. Now it's a very comforting verse, but that can take your whole life to unpack that verse. And here's one story that we're looking at today that you can learn what it means. God called Jonah to be a preacher of grace, but he wouldn't be good at it until he failed at it first. Tim Keller, quote, until Jonah failed and saw how weak he was and how stupid he was, until he saw the idols of his life, his racial superiority and his spiritual pride, he was not competent to speak on sin and grace. Therefore, until he failed, he wasn't competent to be a preacher. So this is what you might call an intervention. Y'all know what an intervention is? You know, when, when someone is addicted to drugs or alcohol, the people that love them sort of create this gathering where they confront them and they make an ultimatum. You know, we're, we're intervening. We, we love you so much. We don't want you to continue to go down this path. We don't want your heart and your life to go down this path. It's ruining relationships. It's ruining your life. It's making you somebody that you don't want to be and taking you places that you don't want to go. So we're going to create this intervention. And this story, the book of Jonah, is an intervention. It's God, and you know where the intervention happens? In the belly of a whale. God intervenes, Jonah gets in the belly of the whale, it's like God's sitting there, surprise. All right, let's talk. And that is where God begins to peel back the layers of Jonah's legalism, self-righteousness, racism, hatred, superiority. So this is an intervention. Like when a bunch of friends get an alcoholic or an addict into a corner and confront them, and they say, you're weak and helpless, and you need to admit that, or you're going to die. And God's doing the same thing. So until you see that you don't have it together, you'll never have it together. And that's why God's intervention usually includes a storm. And sometimes the storm is that we get what we want, and it doesn't satisfy. Sometimes the storm is we don't get what we want. 
In some of our lives, it works out like this. We've, we've built our lives around a goal and we say, this will complete me. And if we don't get it, God used the disappointment and the frustration to bring us to himself and to show us that only he is truly and ultimately satisfying. So sometimes we don't get what we want. And that's the lesson where God comes into our lives, shows us grace and shows us his love and mercy as all satisfying. Other times, however, it works the other way. God lets you get the desire of your heart. You obtain the success. You obtain the love of your life, so you thought. You attain the achievement that you wanted to achieve. And then it isn't ultimately satisfying. And there's this disorientation. I remember hearing uh, at the time Green Bay, quarterback, Green Bay Packers quarterback Brett Favre um, kind of was debriefing how he felt right after the Super Bowl when he was given the Lombardi Trophy and he held it up. And he said, that was a very empty moment in my life because I raised it up and I realized I'd reached the great goal of my life. And something in my heart said, that's it. And I was empty. And I believe Brett Favre has since come to know the Lord. Um, Mel Gibson famously, when he was the Prince of Hollywood in the 1980s, now says that that was the darkest time of his life and he was suicidal and was moments away from taking his life one night. He got what he wanted and it wasn't ultimately satisfying. If you don't know, he's the, he's the man, the actor that eventually made the movie, The Passion of the Christ. So sometimes God lets you get what, we, what you do want and, and it, it just doesn't satisfy, it doesn't complete us and that shows us that he is ultimately our completion and our satisfaction. And what God whispers to us in that moment is, you still don't get life yet. You don't understand it yet. Until you center upon me, you don't have life. And the New Testament says it plainly, doesn't it? Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. And when storms come, sometimes though, we, we sort of act like the alcoholic or the addict who needs intervention. We say, I don't need this. I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm, this is unfair. But the storm is all in love. There's love in the storm. But storms don't always create depth and wisdom, do they? Because ultimately, it's your response to the storm. And the same thing that can make you great, the, the great trial of your life, the, the trials that come into our lives, the same thing that can make you great can also destroy you. And that's what I often tell marriages that are on the rocks. I say, this can actually make your marriage great or it can destroy your marriage. Your response to this storm is everything. And there are some who say, I've had storms and my life is hard because this, so-and-so did this to me or, or, or you know, blame, sort of blame shifting and blame it on somebody else. But until we come to terms with what God is trying to teach our hearts about sin and grace, we don't grasp what he's doing. And so he creates these storms and he, he's loving us through these storms to bring us to himself. So your response will make or break you. Let's look at Jonah's response then. We looked at the storm. Let's look at the response. In the beginning of the story, Jonah runs from God. This time, it seems Jonah responds correctly to the storms, the storm, and we can start to learn from him. And we see that in verses 10 through 17. First of all, the sailors are trying to find out who's to blame. And did you see, do you see Jonah's response? He stops hiding. It seems like he's not gonna run anymore. He's like, I'm caught. It's me. I did it. It's my fault. And so some things we learn from Jonah's response that I think we can apply to our own lives. Number one, Jonah's storm and Jonah's sin has endangered everyone in the boat and everybody in the boats nearby. And the fact is that we've all had the storms of someone else's sin break on us. And that's how this fallen world works sometimes. Somebody else's sin will cause the waves to break on you. And we see that in this story. Jonah's sin and Jonah's storm has become everybody's storm. And uh, it, for me, growing up um, in the home of an alcoholic father, this is something I had a front row seat to. As in my younger years and as a young man, I really struggled to forgive my father as I would even have conversations word for word, like they were happening in real time in my head. They were so vivid in my mind, those conversations would replay. 
and just the, the anger toward my father and the, the sin that he brought into our home, the storms that he constantly brought into our home. Uh, I struggled to forgive him. And it wasn't until I was a young man in college and I was in a church that, uh, that loved me well and gave me the gospel that I was able to start processing those things. And the Lord gave me grace to forgive my father. But his, the waves of my father's sin broke on me for a long time. And it actually shaped me and my life and probably the way I interact with a lot of, the, of other people for a long time. And maybe you can relate to that. Somebody else's storm has broken in upon your life or is breaking in upon your life. And I think maybe the question we ask when that happens is, well, is that fair? There's a book written called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. The problem with the book is it committed the error of proving a faulty assumption, a faulty premise. It assumes that there are some who deserve a good life. And in the gospels, the disciples come to Jesus and ask him about a tragedy that happened. This is sort of like, you know, a bridge collapse or something. Of their day, there was a tower that fell on a bunch of people and killed 18 people in his day. Sort of the, you know, the headline of the USA Today, so to speak, in that time. And they come to Jesus and they ask him about the Tower of Siloam. And they ask this, are, are those 18 people on whom the Tower of Siloam Oh, I'm sorry, they asked him if, if they were greater sinners. And Jesus' answer was, uh, those 18 people on whom the t Tower of Siloam fell and killed, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Jesus asked that. He says, no, they weren't, but repent lest ye likewise perish. He's saying, don't be so arrogant as to assume that people with tragedy in their lives are worse people than you. Because the truth is, and this is what Jesus is teaching here, none of us actually get what we deserve. God gives all things to us and look at how we often treat him. We don't give him honor or allegiance or authority that he deserves. We often try to usurp his authority by sitting on the throne of our hearts. While we may acknowledge his existence, the plain fact is that often we make all our decisions hinge on our own desires, our own appetites, our own joy, and our own glory. And God in his mercy doesn't give us what we deserve. If he gave us what we deserve based on how we treated him and others, we'd be wiped out in a moment. And that's why uh, author, writer, theologian John Stott said this. Look at this quote. The most profound theological question is not why bad things happen to good people, but why God tolerates us in our sin. If the wages of sin is death, why aren't we all gone right now? <laughs> it's because God is merciful and he's gracious. That's why. And so Jesus is saying, don't think those people on whom the tower fell are worse sinners than you because God hasn't given any of us ultimately what we deserve. So look out, look up. Hope the tower's not falling on you. But it's not because God is gracious and merciful and he's restraining. He's restraining his wrath and anger and justice and it fell on Christ. And for those who have not received Christ, there is a day of judgment appointed. So the real theological conundrum is why is God showing us so much kindness? Why is he giving us so much love in life when we've rebelled against him as we have? And the only logical answer is because he's merciful and loving. And if we don't get that, the world will be an incredibly disappointing place for us. So Jesus is saying the tower didn't fall because they're being punished. If God was actually punishing us, we'd all be gone. Instead, he's saying the tower fell because God has a sovereign purpose in it for his glory and the good of his people. So that's the first thing we learned from Jonah's response is his storm has endangered everybody in the boats and the boats around him. The second thing we learn is repentance creates clarity, confidence, calm, and worship. Remember Job who suffered so much in the Old Testament. His response was an anger toward God, but in the end his response was, at least in the end, his response was worship. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He trusted God. He threw off the temptation to complain and accuse God of doing him wrong. Job bowed and worshiped and trusted in the end. And this is what we see Jonah doing in the face of this storm. Jonathan Edwards' wife, Sarah, wrote to her daughter about her husband's, her famous husband's death in his mid-50s. And she said this, and I have it on the screen for you. Here's what she wrote to her daughter. My very dear child, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands upon our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had him so long. But my God lives and he has my heart. Oh, what a legacy my husband and your father has left us. 
We are all given to God, and there I am and love to be, your affectionate mother, Sarah Edwards. Where did Sarah Edwards get such strength? She knew who she was, and she knew who God is. So there was a sweetness there, isn't there? There's a humility there. She knew she was a creature, not the creator. Do you think repentance is unhealthy? It wasn't for Sarah Edwards. When she said, I don't deserve the blessings I got and God has purpose in all that he does, it actually created security, peace, confidence, faith, and trust in her. So when we admit our sin, we'll begin to see the glory of God everywhere. So this is what Jonah's doing. They say, tell us what you've done. He goes, it's me, it's my fault. There's this clarity. Suddenly he sees crystal clear, 2020, it's me. He takes responsibility. And he doesn't even talk about himself that much at all. And repentance is like that. It takes our focus off of ourselves and it puts it on God. It seems the sailors are only thinking of themselves. They're, they're even willing to go to God, it seems, but only to get out of their mess. Their minds are all wrong. But Jonah's had a complete shift of the way he's thinking. He gets his mind off of himself. He doesn't think of himself. He lifts his eyes to God and he begins to look to God. And, he, and in essence, he says, how could I have been so stupid and ungrateful? I'm a Hebrew rescued by God from captivity and I've been chosen to display the glory of God and I've rejected God's commandment. So repentance is thinking about something bigger than you. You know, if you hold a page close to your eyes, it's really hard to read it, you know? can't read my notes if, my, if the page is this close. But when I pull it away, the letters become smaller and things begin to make sense. Only when we get our eyes off of ourselves, our problems, our needs, and our hurt feelings can we begin to see the truth of what God is doing. Only when I start to see what matters to God, not just what matters to me, what his purposes are, what glorifies him, does my life even begin to make sense. And this is what's happening in Jonah's life. Only when God started to look big again in his heart and in his mind did his own life and desires start to look small again. So do you think that repentance is unimportant in this process? It's crucially important. important. So a storm comes. What is your response to the storm? They can shipwreck a person or it can change a person. The ones who bow, the ones who do not demand their rights, the ones who put their eyes on God are the ones who gain new freedoms. And once he repents, there's this calmness and courage that seems to come into Jonah's life. His sanity comes back to him and they, they throw him into the water. And the third thing we see about Jonah's response and what is happening as Jonah responds is there's love in the water. When they throw him in the water, he doesn't know it yet, but he's finding grace because underneath the waves of this trial, underneath the waves of his repentance, underneath the waves of his brokenness, there's grace. Under the water, love is waiting for him. God has made provision for him. And whenever you obey God, it might seem like it's over, but God always makes provision beneath the waves. He always makes provision beneath the water. It's the principle of the kingdom. It's the death resurrection cycle of the kingdom. It's the way of Christ himself. Jesus said, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's the way of the kingdom. It's the kingdom principle. We go low and we go up, right? The way up is down. The way to freedom is surrender. The way to rule is to submit. Jesus in his death now reigns in glory. Jonah threw himself in the water and found provision. If you'll throw yourself into the will of God for your life, if you'll throw yourself into the water, you will also find grace because there's love in the water. And the last thing we see is that Jonah was a substitute. He was the wrath bearer for everybody in this story. It seemed the storm was gonna destroy everybody in, the, in this entire universe we're looking at in the book of Jonah. But one man steps forward and says, throw me in the water. And the storm is calm and everybody's saved, except for Jonah. Well, he is eventually. Jonah was the substitute. And Jesus, of course, is the truer and better Jonah. 
Jesus was the substitute just as Jonah was the substitute. Jonah surrendered to God's will and threw himself in the water to save everybody from the storm. And Jesus did the same thing at Gethsemane when he bowed and sweat drops of blood. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. Throw me overboard. Throw me into the storm. Throw me into the water. And now we have, just like the sailors had, nothing but sunshine because the storm has been calmed by the redeeming shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. So Jesus understands what it's like to be in the worst of storms. And you know, I, I, as pastors, we deal with a lot of suffering. People come to us and you know, there, there's situations where the number one question is why? Why did this happen? I had a, um, a dear friend call me a few months after we moved here in 2021 and his son who had been part of our wrestling club, uh, 15 years old, uh, his parents went to the mall for a walk and they came back and found that he'd shot himself. This sweet kid left a suicide note and he said, I, I know I've been a disappointment to you, dad. And his dad said, disappointment? He was the apple of my eye. And just to watch my friend and try to process this. And I don't know what to say to him. Why? I don't know why. There's a thousand reasons God allows what he allows and why God does what he does. And he only shows us a couple of them, but I can tell you one day we will know because somehow you get to that 30,000 foot view and you get up way up high in the mountain and you can see how things are connected that you can't see when you're in the valley. And one day we'll all be up on the mountain. You know, we recently took a plane trip to Chicago and I'm looking down and I'm looking at how some of the roads are connected and I'm like, oh, there's a car coming right here. I wonder if that car sees that car that's about to come around that bend. I can see it clearly because I can see how things are connected. And you and I will all be able to see how things are connected one day when Jesus makes every sad day untrue and wipes away every tear. But right now we're in the now and the not yet, aren't we? So what do I say to somebody who says, why? When I get a terrible phone call like that. What I can say is, I don't know why, but I can tell you that Jesus understands human pain. The Bible says he was tempted in all manners such as we are, and yet without sin. Jesus threw himself into the greatest storm that there ever was, the storm of God's wrath, the storm of the cross. He threw himself into it and gave himself. And so here's the comfort I can offer. We have a savior who knows, a savior who understands, a savior whose feet got dirty with earthly dust from the streets of and the roads of Israel and Jerusalem. He knows, he understands. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. And I can tell you that even though this seed has died, God will bring forth fruit from this one day if we will just trust him. And sometimes he gives you just enough for the day, just enough to get through the day. And I can tell you that in the worst of my depression back in the early 2000s, when I didn't feel God's joy or God's grace or God's peace, when it just seemed like the heavens were brass, God's grace was still there in the ability to endure the trial. That's where his grace appeared, was he gave me perseverance to be able to endure that trial and to come through the other side. And like a sky turns pink and orange after a long black night, that's what happened as I began to study the scriptures like I never had. I studied Romans 8 and Galatians 5 for a year. And it's like the sun started to come up in my life and the sun started to shine again as I had a revelation of God's grace that made me feel born again, again. It made me feel like I didn't even know the Lord before that. I don't know how he does it. And I think I was embodying Galatians 3.3, 3, will you continue in the flesh that which you began in the spirit? I think I did. And yet he rescued me. He came to me just like he came to Jonah, just like he came to my friend, Chris just like he came to Job. So let's trust him and respond to our storms in faith, even if we don't understand. And we will not fully understand. That's what makes God, God. Is he, know, he knows things you don't know and he sees things you don't see. That's what makes God, God and me, not God. So there's times where I just need to bow. And listen, we, we all grew up in a Greco-Roman society, right? We like, to, we like evidence and facts and we want things solved in laboratories. And if I can't see it solved in a, in a laboratory experiment, then I won't believe it. That's the society we've grown up in. But remember, we're reading stories that came from a, a Hebrew culture. And what we find with the Hebrews from the Old Testament to the New Testament is when they didn't understand something, you know what they would do? Oftentimes they would just bow and they'd say, you're God. And I think we need to learn how to be more Hebraic 
in that sense. That when we don't understand, not demand all the answers and demand to be God, but there's certain things that we, we accept in faith when God, for his sovereign purposes, does not tell us everything. Because Jonah didn't see the end of this yet. We, and we have the whole book now. We're like, Jonah, just, you're fine. Just hang out. The whale's going to come. You're going to have this meeting with God in the belly of the whale. He's, gonna, he, he's like a bus. He's going to take you where you need to go. He'll drop you off on the shores near Nineveh, and you can go and do what God told you to do. It's all good, Jonah. He doesn't see that yet. We have the benefit of the end of the story. You don't see the end of your story either, do you? You don't know where this is going. Can you trust God? Can you trust God? And maybe make, let Jonah's story stand in for you? Because the way God worked in Jonah's life is the same way he's working in our lives, same way he's working in your life. Let's trust him in the water. Let's trust him in the storm. Whether it be a small or a big storm, God is moving through all of it. God is in control. God is sovereign. God is providential. God is good. God is working. And we can trust him. So how do we apply this message? Two simple ideas, and I suppose they're somewhat abstract, but this, this book really does get to the heart uh, more than the, the external, the, the practicals of the Christian faith. This book sort of gets to the, it kind of does heart surgery on us, like it was doing on Jonah. So the two applications are, let's reject self-pity and repent. Repent of the ways that we have rejected his rule, his will, and his command in our lives. Number two, let's trust in the one who threw himself in the storm and substituted himself for you. So let's reject self-pity and repent, and let's trust in our truer and better Jonah who gave himself for us, that he will lead us on our journey and he will lead us on our story. Let's pray. Lord, your word says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And even though at the beginning of the story, Jonah did not humble himself, by your sovereign grace and wisdom, you sent a storm because the storm was the wisest way for Jonah to humble himself, for you to get Jonah to the place where he would see what he needed to see and learn what he needed to know. So Lord, we trust your wisdom that no matter what's happening in our lives, no matter what's happening in our country or in our world, we humble ourselves before you and we say, we trust you and we trust your wisdom. That yes, you're sovereign, but you're also good and wise, which means that the storm is the best way in your wisdom for us to learn your grace and move into your purposes in our lives. So help us, Lord. Right now, we humble ourselves. Lord, we turn from, we repent of our, self-pity, our self-righteousness, our superiority. We thank you, Lord, that we all stand on the same ground before the cross because your word says, every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain laid low in the day of the Messiah. That the lowly one, the condemned one, the discouraged one, the depressed one will be lifted up and the haughty, prideful, self-righteous one will be brought down and we will all stand on the same ground before the cross we all receive the same salvation, the same love, the same grace. So we humble ourselves before you and trust in him who threw himself into the storm. And Father, I thank you that if we give ourselves to you, I thank you that there's love in the storm. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We gather every Sunday at the Clarksville area YMCA. For more information, please go to our website at redeeminghope.org.